Hey guys, this is Peter with the Command Valley bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing it, check the link out in the description below. We have a copy and pasteable deck list in the description that you can paste right into their deck builder and buy your singles there. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. Today we are diving into another Zendikar Rising Commander, maybe the last one that we'll cover, we'll see with uh, delays with Commander Legends, but we're going to be talking about Zagreus, Thief of Heartbeats. Zagreus, Thief of Heartbeats, is a legendary creature vampire rogue. He's a 4-4, he costs 4, a black, and a red. He costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party. He has flying, death touch, and haste. Other creatures you control have death touch. And whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. My first impression of Zagreus was a bit underwhelming when we were doing our set review. He costs a lot, he looks like he synergizes well with party, which doesn't really have a lot of support yet, but then I realized that one, I've never built a Rakdos deck before, and two, Death Touch Tribal has been on the top of my mind since Hooded Blightfang was revealed in Core 21. After looking into the strategy of Zagreus a little bit further, I realized that there's a lot of potential with using low-costing pingers to control the board. So that's the strategy. Bring out a bunch of small pingers and give them death touch to control the board. Then once we have built enough mana up, we'll end the game with one of our many finishers. Let's get into it. The bulk of the work done in this deck is done by our pingers. These are creatures that will do direct damage, usually just one point of damage to any target, and hitting creatures is what we want to do with them. I've separated these into two categories, the limited use pingers and the mass group pingers. And we'll start with the limited ones. The nicest thing about pinging is that if you give these creatures death touch, they'll essentially be kill spells because that one point of damage that they are doing is enough to destroy any creature they target, save a couple of exceptions and we'll talk about how to get around those later. First off, we have Blood Cultist, Volstrock Sorcerer, Cunning Spark Mage, Jessica Warrior Adept, and Endbringer, and they're all essentially the same. Once per turn, we can ping something by tapping it. Endbringer can tap a little bit more frequently on every person's turn, and is worth the higher mana cost to keep around. These will ensure that any problematic creatures on the board we can quickly take care of, and it's always good to have at least one of these on the board. Rakdos Ixpitter does the same, but it can only target creatures, and subsequently makes its owner lose a life. This is like hitting two birds with one stone. Even though we can only be used once per turn, this is still a kill spell on a stick that stings a little bit more. Lightning Prowess is not a pinger itself, but it can make a creature a pinger. There are some creatures that we'll talk about later that are great targets for Lightning Prowess, and they don't have recurrable pinging abilities, so this is perfect for them, or even Zagreus, if the situation requires it, can have Lightning Prowess attached to him. Brash Taunter works a little bit differently in that you have to pay for him to fight another creature, but he has indestructible and any damage done to him will be done to any target, which means he can be a pretty flexible blocker and can be turned into a pinger if we need. Mayhem Devil can't ping on his own and has to rely on sacrificing permanence, but the great thing is that he triggers off of everybody sacrificing permanence. So, he can be a deterrent for people using fetch lands or other things that generate treasures like Dockside Extortionist or Smothering Tide, those things that really give a lot of value to a player. Your opponent isn't going to want to see Mayhem Devil, especially if he's playing like a Corvold and he relies on sacrificing permanence. Dreadhorde Butcher isn't really a pinger, but rather he works better when he has death touch and is a really mana efficient creature. He has haste, he pumps himself up when he does damage, and while he's on the battlefield, he can do some damage to something troublesome. I've added Walking Ballista into this category because I happen to pick one up in Double Masters. He's a fantastic card, he's a little bit expensive, and you'll typically see him in combo pieces, but he's not a combo piece in here, he's not a main win con of the deck, and he's more a flexible pinging engine that you can include here. He's not needed, just nice to have. But the great thing about Walking Ballista is that you can basically pay any amount of mana into him and put him on the battlefield, and there you go, you have a limited use pinger. 
And finally, for our limited use pingers, we have Zerzuth Chaos Rider, a jumpstart devil tribal commander that makes devils that will ping our opponents when they die and punishes others for drawing cards when it's not their turn. Zerzuth is pretty situational, but can make us a lot of little devils with death touch and make dealing with our board that much harder. Moving on to our mass pingers, you can see these as pseudo one-sided board wipes, which as we know, are the best kind of board wipes. Some of them that I've included here, of course, are not one-sided because we can't have everything, but they work great as board wipes if the situation permits. First, let's talk about Dagger Caster and Goblin Chain Roller. These two creatures will do one damage to each creature your opponents control and each opponent, and if they have death touch, then everything they hit will die. Timing on these is important because you can get these out alongside Zagras on turn three or four if you play your hands right. They only work once, so play them cautiously. Alternatively, we have other creatures that work after they've entered the battlefield with Goblin Sharpshooter and Deathbringer Proctar. The Sharpshooter taps to ping and then untaps whenever something dies, which means he can recursively untap and tap again to eliminate each creature on your opponent's boards. Deathbringer Proctar works differently where he gets plus one plus one counters when things die and then remove those counters to ping, which means if he has one plus one plus one counter on him, if basically if one of our other pingers kills something, then he can similarly wipe your opponent's boards. I recommend both of these because they work in different situations. Deathbringer Proctar works almost immediately when he comes out and doesn't have to wait for summoning sickness, but he costs twice as much to cast, and Goblin Sharpshooter is cheap to cast, but can't work right away without a haste enabler. These are very powerful creatures with our commander out, but take a certain board state to be absolute bombs. Thornbite Staff works the same as the sharpshooter, except it's an equipment which means that we need to attach it to something in order for it to work. The best target is one of our limited pingers from the previous section. Since they only require tapping to ping, any one of them can be transformed into a goblin sharpshooter using the staff. There are even a couple of them that are shamans, which can bypass that equip cost and make it even easier to level the playing field. The last two cards I'd like to talk about are Arcbond and Chandra's Ignition. These will both wipe the entire board rather than just be one-sided board wipes, which is less ideal, but can still work in our favor if we have Zagras out. In fact, Zagras is probably the most likely target for either of these and make it so we can save our commander in the end. Chandra's Ignition is a great win con and so is Arcbond, but please be careful because that damage is also dealt to you, so that's very situational. As mentioned previously, there are some pitfalls to the death touch strategy. Two problems in particular come to mind. The first one is that some pingers like Goblin Sharpshooter do not have haste and cannot work immediately. This makes it harder for us to control the board in a sticky situation. For that reason, we've included Fervor and Anger, which will both give all of our creatures haste and make it easier for us to control the board. For more recent sets, you could also use Tuk Tuk Rubble Fort and Footfall Crater. Rubble Fort is a slightly worse fervor since it's a creature, but that also means it's a pretty budget card. And Footfall Crater is really is a really unique land enchantment aura that can help us with our haste problem as well. The second pitfall centers around creatures that won't die from death touch. These creatures will either have indestructible or regenerate that makes it impossible to destroy them or hexproof or shroud which makes it impossible to target them. Regenerate is probably the hardest one to deal with, but it's not impossible. To take care of Hexproof and Shroud and Indestructible, we have Shadow Spear and Arcane Lighthouse. Both of these have abilities that allow us to remove these restrictions from our opponent's creatures for a pretty low cost. That will allow us to use our pingers to get through to them with no problem. Shadow Spear is also great at giving something Trample and Lifelink or something, like our commander, to finish somebody off. That leaves Regenerate, which I'm going to have to defer Olivian Vildaren to take care of. In the absence of the other things mentioned, our best option is just to steal the things that are causing us problems, especially things with Indestructible or Regenerate. 
Olivia Voldaren normally functions as a pinger in our deck, and a pretty good one at that, especially because we can pay mana to activate her ability. But if by chance she doesn't kill whatever she pings, that creature will turn into a vampire. Subsequently, we can activate her second ability and gain control of it. So worry no longer about that Avacyn sitting across the table. She'll make a nice addition in Olivia's vampire army. We have a few more cards that get better with death touch synergies. Ogre Slumlord will simply make a whole bunch of death touchers when other things die. But the great thing is if Slumlord gets removed, our rats will still have death touch thanks to Zagreus. As mentioned earlier in the deck tech, Hooded Blightfang works amazingly with everything that has Death Touch and can even make our pingers take out Planeswalkers just by pinging them, rather than having to deal combat damage like Zagros requires. It also allows us to drain our opponents as well, overall just a very nice essential card to have in this deck. The last one on this list is Basilisk Caller, which admittedly doesn't do much with our commander out besides giving lifelink, but lifelink is a valuable research to keep around with our pingers and it doesn't hurt to have some redundancy in case our commander gets removed. Next, I have a small sub-theme of sacrificing and recurring creatures. Naturally, it's easy to ping our own creatures and let them go to the graveyard, so we want a couple of ways to get them back and take advantage of that in this deck. We'll also see a lot of creatures getting interacted with because they're seen as threats if they have death touch, so getting them back from the graveyard is just very important for the deck. Blood Artist is probably my favorite card in this section, mostly because he triggers off of other people's creatures dying as well. That's going to give us some extra value when doing what our deck already does. Judith the Scourge Diva and Midnight Reaper also give us benefits when other creatures die, which will hopefully happen less often if we're playing optimally, but can still deter a board wipe coming from our opponent's side and wiping out our board. For recursion, we have the new Agadim's Awakening and Thwart the Grave, both of which work well to get cards from the graveyard and work with the other things in the deck. Doomed Necromancer will get us one creature back from the graveyard, but he's also a cleric. And Chainer Nightmare Adept works great to recast creatures that were put in the graveyard recursively, and it's not so bad to discard cards in Rakdos colors. The best but also the most expensive to cast in this category is Grave Betrayal. A 7 mana enchantment that doesn't recur our own creatures, but it will recur our opponent's creatures to the board. With the amount of board wipe potential we have in the deck and the pinging, this will go a long way if we are able to hold onto it, and we can basically just steal any creature on the board that we can target with a pinger. Now that we've gone through the meat of the deck, let's ha go through the essentials left to talk about. Ramp, card draw, and interaction. Starting with ramp, you'll find that we have to rely a lot on mana rocks because we don't have green in our mana cost. The highlights include Rakdos Key Rune, which I like as a backup death touching creature that we can use in the pinch, and Lava Brink Floodgates, a new C2020 card that can also wipe the board if we're not careful or if our opponents really want that to happen, but will most likely just give us a consistent two red mana. I'm running Dockside Extortionist in this deck because I have one, but the deck doesn't necessarily need him. He is really good with Mayhem Devil Out, and we can take advantage of our own sacrifice synergies to help us get ahead, and he also is a ramp spell. It's a really good card to have in red, but you don't need him to make the deck good, so don't go spend $30. Besides those, we're running Rakdos Signet, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Talisman of Indulgence, Felwar Stone, Thought Vessel, and Mind Stone. There aren't any other surprises here, just good old Rakdos mana rocks. Next, we'll go over the card advantage, which is actually the part I'm most worried about covering in this deck. If we don't have good card advantage at basically all points in the game, since our commander doesn't have any of his own, then we're simply top decking and hoping for answers we need beyond opening hands. That's why you'll see a lot of these help us dig through the deck. I'm not including any tutors in this version of the deck, but tutors go a long way to respond to specific situations, and Black has a lot of great tutors. So when you're building this deck, make sure you pay close attention to your card advantage, and just I'll list out the ones that I've included here. Rakdos fortunately does have some interesting options for card advantage. Let's start with Light Up the Stage, a spell that we can cast for one if we do damage to someone that turn, which and can get us two cards off of the top of the library, 
that we can play until our next turn. There's almost never a feel bad for this spell. Even if you just get two lands off the top, speaking from experience, that's actually just pseudo ramp and it's helping us dig deeper for answers. Valakut Awakening is the newest card in the list and one of my favorites from Zendikar Rising. It allows us to discard any number of cards and draw that many cards plus one, or can be a land if you want. In my experience, later in the game, this is very useful for getting lands out of your hand and irrelevant cards to the current table meta and filling up your hand with cards that help you more right now. Luca Copperco Outcast is in this deck, making it the first deck that I've actually found a bit of use for him. So far, his minus two ability is the most useful, specifically the transmogrify ability to turn one of our one-time pinging creatures and trade up for something bigger. The curve of this deck is rather low, so the ideal target for Luka is something that costs four mana, because our high-costing creatures in this deck are a really good trade-off for almost any of those. His plus one is useful for card advantage, and his minus seven is another Chandra's Ignition effect, but I found myself using the minus two more often and not really relying on hitting that ultimate. Next is Corpse Augur, which will work if we have an opponent that is playing a lot of creatures that our pingers have affected especially well. We can choose their graveyard and draw a bunch of cards. Simple as that. Mind's Eye will also draw us some cards, and while it's slow due to the higher mana cost, it's still very helpful if it sticks around. Additionally, no red deck would be complete without some sort of wheel effect, and Magus of the Wheel is fulfilling that purpose for me. One that I initially missed when constructing this deck is Castle Lockthwain, a land from Throne of Eldraine that will draw us a card and then make us lose life equal to the number of cards in our hands. This will help in situations where we don't have a lot of cards in our hand, which I found is shockingly easy in Rakdos. New Rakdos player, I know. I didn't love this land before, but Castle Lockthwain works really well in these colors. Thank you, Matt, for suggesting that to me. Finally, I've included Neheb, Dreadhorde Champion. He functions in two parts. He lets us cycle cards similarly to Valakut Awakening when he attacks, and then he gives us mana based on how much we discarded. It's an interesting ramp piece, and it's pretty situational, but I feel like giving him Death Touch will also let us go a long way in breaking down those walls and letting us use him multiple times. Moving on to our interaction section. We have to acknowledge that our pingers are already really, really good at interaction and taking care of creatures. However, there are going to be some things that are going to be harder to deal with, and despite the fact that we have a large number of pingers, sometimes they won't have death touch or we won't have enough. That's what our interaction is for, getting us to the point where we can play out our strategy. And most likely, you'll see in this game that if you're controlling the board with pingers, your opponents are going to find ways to bring out spells that can't be affected as badly with the pingers. So so these interaction spells will help with that. This is the first deck that I'm putting Pyroblast into because it turns out that the deck really functions more as a control deck than anything. So it feels like we need a counter spell or at least a counter counter spell as Pyroblast is. For targeted removal, we have Terminate and Bedevil, which are just classic Rakdos spells. And then we have Feed the Swarm and Chaos Warp. Feed the Swarm allows us for some enchantment removal in black, which is a great addition from Zendikar Rising. Chaos Warp, as always, is just good permanent removal and can take care of those troublesome creatures that we can't deal with. And finally, we have Vandal Blast, which is never a bad option for artifact removal on the small scale or on the board wipe scale. If there's one weak point that I have to point out in this deck, it would be the protection, for which I'm only including Lightning Greaves. I've reasoned that the lower curve of the deck warrants for a little more of an aggressive control strategy rather than hunkering down. So Zagros dying really isn't the end of the world for us because as long as we have other creatures on the board, recasting Zagros will make it so it doesn't feel like a dead turn. However, if you can protect him, it saves a lot of trouble later on. So consider swapping some of these interaction pieces or maybe a ping or two for some protection so that you can keep what you have on the board. Finally, let's talk about our win cons. Since our deck is primarily direct damage based, almost all of our win cons have synergies with doing lots of damage to our opponents. First, we have the ones that make us do more damage, which are Fiery Emancipation, Torbrand Thane of Redfell, and Furnace of Wrath. Any one of these on the field will help us when we're doing direct damage to our opponents, and if we don't have Death Touch, it matters for our pingers. 
Wound reflection works similarly but causes loss of life instead. Not necessarily worst, in fact it works just as well as Furnace of Wrath would but just worth noting. Comet Storm is our other damage based wind con, which will hopefully also be reaping the benefits from the boosting enchantments that we just mentioned. Last but not least, we have Torment of Hailfire, which is just so good in the late game, it's hard to pass up. Just decimating our opponent's boards and hands if they can't take the damage. Casting this on turn 7 or 8 is usually a good place to be, and then swinging in to finish off your opponents will certify you the win. Let's quickly go over our mana base. I'm running 34 lands in all with 16 mountains and 9 swamps. Lava Claw Reaches is in the deck for the same reason that I've included Rakdos Key Rune. It can be a flexible death toucher if we don't have any other options. Rick's Mahdi Dungeon Palace can simply make everyone discard cards, which isn't really the point of the deck, but it can help in certain situations. We were also running Graven Cairns, Luxury Suite, Blood Crypt, Dragon Skull Summit, and Reliquary Tower. Usually I would advise that the amount of money you spend on your mana base should typically be less because in reality you don't want to spend a fortune on your lands. That being said, I would try to make your mana base work a little bit faster in this deck due to the strategy that's directed around controlling the pieces on the board sooner in the game so that you can deal with your opponent's threats as they come out. Try to minimize the lands that come in tapped by default as much as you can. And otherwise, basic lands are fine to run as well, as we have enough mana rocks that this two color deck doesn't typically run into mana fixing issues. And that's it. That's all I have for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I want to do a quick shout out to Matt, one of our channel sculptor patrons. He was a huge help in crafting this deck, gave me a lot of ideas, and it was really nice to have a uh, Rakdos player thinking along this these same lines with me and, and discovering how to make this deck good. So thank you, Matt. You helped a lot. If you also want to participate in the building of these decks and further perks, check out our Patreon. Just sign up today. It supports the channel so much, and we appreciate every single one of our patrons. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this episode as always. Going through the link in the description is an affiliate link and it will help the channel. They ship nationwide so you can get your singles wherever you are. And Commander Legends is on sale now. I know that they are selling boxes. If you want to get yours now, go ahead and go to GameGrid. They have a great system go check it out. We have live streams every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Griffin plays a great game of Brawl every Tuesday, and it's a lot of fun, so come check it out. Follow us on Twitter at CommandValleyP1, and like us on Facebook. There are links to all of our social media accounts and all of our podcast links down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have enjoyed Zendikar Rising as much as we have. We're looking forward to Commander Legends, and we hope it would come faster. Stay safe out there. Have a good week. Bye.